Our time when we get into the dailies and uh, before then let me just remind you what we're discussing this morning quote Kenya in receivership are we in receivership is the question and uh, I'll be posing said question to these gentlemen here that is Professor Exen Iraqi and economist in studio we have Dr. Abraham Rugo Murui Mur Muriu who will be joining us virtually I do beg your pardon Abraham and he's the country manager international budget partnership Kenya and uh, in studio we also have Karumba Kinyua Investment a Consultant. And this is a question. Is the economy stable or on the brink? Government has been sending us sending us mixed messages. What is the correct position? Prof, I hope you're ready. But first, let's take a look at the Daily Nation. Daily Nation, we have an image of Francis Atwoli, who is the Secretary General Kotu. End of an era death of trade unions wielding enormous power with their sizable constituency countrywide structures and the potential to mobilize members on social or political matters trade unions have always been a thorn in the flesh for success successive governments but not anymore the workers lobbies of 2023 have lost their spark and are now a pale shadow of their former self so we're told see pages six and seven i'm curious what my panelists make of this Cracks in Kenya Kwanzaa over taxes, cost of living, and fuel prices. Let me just uh, zoom in a little bit so that we can see it better. Here we go. And uh, President William Ruto's nascent. There we go. Much better. Nascent administration is facing a litmus test as calls for a cabinet reshuffle grow louder amid infighting in the government. Soaring cost of living compounded by rising fuel prices, increased taxation, squabbling within the government and a restive support base present the president with a tough balancing act once he returns to the country from the United States. Further compounding the myriad of challenges the head of state will be confronted with is a seemingly re-energized opposition which has threatened to deploy an unstated action against the ruling regime. There is a figure highlighted here on the front page and that is 211 and uh, 211 shillings and 64 cents current cost of a liter of petrol in nairobi fuel prices crossed the 200 shilling mark for the first time in history following the government's latest review this will have far-reaching consequences on households that are already struggling with the high cost of living what else is on the front page well they've highlighted on uh, the equivalent of the ticker here kenya beats zimbabwe to qualify for paris olympics and that is in rugby and family now demands just for girl found dead at City University. Questions abound over the murder of a Daystar University student within the institution's premises with her family demanding answers. Marcy Gerono, 18, was killed just four days after reporting at Daystar's Athi River campus in Machakos County. And uh, we look now at the front page of the Business Daily, Kakuzi bosses under probe over payments to related companies. This particular report filed by one Washington Gikunju and uh, senior officials of Kakuzi PLC are under investigation over financial and other dealings in the company. Uh, the capital markets regulator has revealed the CMA in a report released a short while ago is investigating allegations which is proven could disclose transactions at the NSC listed agricultural firm that may have cost shareholders dearly for years while enriching some officials of the company. The company officials are accused of forming companies and approving payments totaling millions of shillings from Kakuzi to these entities without disclosing their interests. One of the officials is said to be facing a conflict of interest charge for doubling as a Kakuzi director and a senior executive whose board services are outsourced through a company in which he is owner. Another official who is director of a Kakuzi related company is identified as a recipient of millions of shillings that were wired out of the company between January 2018 and May 2021. So CMA has accused officials of not disclosing interest in these firms and dis the dispute is headed to the Capital Markets Tribunal. Farther down, we see new NHIF premiums capped at 5,000 shillings for top earners. On the ticker, we see SRC marks more allowances for scrapping 
SRC has identified more allowances for removal in its push to harmonize public sector pay. The secondary scraps, which mark the third phase of the review of allowances, are expected to involve employing institutions. Rubis takes 4.7 billion shilling bond as payment for fuel subsidy. Rubis Energy Kenya converted 4.7 billion shillings worth of pending fuel subsidy dues to government bonds by the end of June as part of the state's deal with oil marketers to settle the payment delays new disclosures show and KCB Corp Bank fight for second place in market value ratings. Corp and KCB are now nearly tied in market capitalization with the outcome reflecting the major share price fall that has hit the latter. Okay, so let us take a look now at uh, what the front page of the Thai Folio looks like. Here we go. Shoka Yuyao and uh, Rais Ruto ashinikizwa awateme mawaziri wa mafis, na mafisa kadha kwa mienendo ya yao isioridhisha. Upayukaji huenda maafisa kadha wangazi ya juu wa sidumu serikalini au wakahamishwa baada ya viongozi mbalimbali wa Kenya kwanza akiwemo naibu rais kiongozi wa mawaziri na seneta Halwale kumtaka rais achukue hatua kali dhidi ya wa ropokaji wa wana tepetea kazini and we have an image here of Moses Kuria, uh, Davis Church, uh, David Ndi, Susan Akumicha, Babu Namamba and Alice Wahome. Musalia Mudavadi quoted here as saying afisa yeyote ana poonesha mienendo isiyofa au kwenda kinyume na utaratibu rais anaweza kufanya mageuzi and uh, halwali is quoted as saying rais na kuhimiza uwafute kazi mawaziri wa biashara kawi na washauri wako wa kiuchumi um, and uh, kwa vidokezo bila faruk huwezi kuingia ikulu kwa tu sasa pia kugoma kwa ushuru and shujaa ndani ya olimpiki vijana wa nyumbani wakanyaga majabali waraga Afrika Kusini na kufuzu and then at the very top here we have an image of uh, Maina Njenga utekaji nyara Maina Njenga viongozi wa azimio wafokea serikali kutumia ukatili wa polisi kutisha wafuasi wao so that is um taifa leo let's take a look now at the standard closely followed by the star and then the people daily and this is the front page <laughs> shortly you'll see it uh, short page front page of um, the uh, standard Kenya Kwanza it will only get worse in the heydays of Tanga Tanga group they castigated Uhuru Kenyatta as a careless leader when prices of fuel hit 134 now in government and prices well over 200 shillings they want you to prepare for even tougher times Dindi Nyoro quoted in 2022 here on the front page it is now so despicable insensitive inconsiderate of the government that we elected that preoccupation every day is to add the cost of living to the people of Kenya Moses Korea in 2023 it is true that we are facing the challenge of soaring cost of living there is nothing to hide we as leaders are telling you the truth the cost of fuel has skyrocketed all over the world an image of President William Bruto the CS uh, in question and Kiharu MP Ndindi Nyoro also on the front page an image here of Mili Odhiambo MP's big push for technology assisted um, conception. Previous attempts by Suba North Member of Parliament, Milio Diambo, to enact laws to regulate technology assisted conception, conception field. The indefatigable legislator is back with two new drafts, which says will offer reprieve to couples battling infertility. Mind battles, bank, bank's powers on auctions. Um, at the very top here, graduate from MB University shares his life's journey. Uh, born of a jobless single mother and later left to fend for himself and siblings until a well-wisher mobilized the community to fund his education. And at the very top here, um, new bill to tame rogue land selling companies, old Museveni rides on past heroics and keep your gone close the season. On a high, I saw an Ethiopian smashed her record um, in the 5,000 meters. Front page of the star now. And it reads rogue borders, tough new laws on the way, heavy fines and jail term for overloading, riding on pavements and wrong side of the road. 
Halwale, an image of Halwale at the very top here. Halwale, uh, Malinya village boy who won't disclose number of kids. Um, Ruto top guns under fire as cost of living soars. We have an image there of uh, Moses Kuya, the trade CS, Davis Churcher, CS Energy and Petroleum, and David D, President's financial advisor. Maina Karubia seems has penned an opened, pioneering a path towards resilience. And Shuja upset South Africa to qualify for 24 Paris Olympics. And here we go. No fight back was hospital was poisoned before being stabbed. Eric Maigo, the Nairobi Hospital Finance Director, who was killed in his house, did not fight back as he was being stabbed 25 times. Post-mortem results show it is unusual for one to fail to react to such infliction of deadly injuries, pointing to the possibility Maigo could have been poisoned before he was killed. And we wrap it up with the people daily. Fuel, why Kenyans are suffering. The government has fallen short of money to stabilize prices as IMF piles pressure to root on Bruto to cut out subsidies. Shilling remains weak against dollar as oil exporting nations reduce supplies, pushing up prices globally. Energy CS Davis Churcher quoted here saying we had some covenants with IMF but suddenly the pain is heavy it is not going to be easy easy sharing the front page is an image of Azimu leaders and mine and Jenga opposition leaders demand that controversial set leader be released amid reports that he was abducted by police squad and at the very top here reshuffle clock ticks for CSS over high costs regarding fires first warning short over ministers comments as Mudavadi hints at possible reorganization and man united funds unhappy with poor performance uh, but before we get into mambo mafuta i see we have like three minutes or so uh prof he mambo ya unions what do you make of it death of trade unions wielding enormous power with their sizable constituency countrywide structures and potential to mobilize members on social or political matters trade unions have always been a thorn in the flesh for successive governments but not anymore do you agree with that assessment I agree with that assessment because mm -hmm. anytime there was <coughs> something like the cost of everything going up, the price of fuel going up, the trade unions were here the first to raise their voice. Mm -hmm. Now they are very quiet. And that's not surprising because as we move towards the current political regime and the past regimes, they tried to bring trade unions closer and closer to them. Something very close to what happened in South Africa. We find that Kosatu is part of the ruling party. So I'm seeing the the so-called trade unions being more and more integrated in the government. <coughs> it is good <coughs> if you are looking for votes because they have a very big constituency. But when you think about the rights of the workers, the rights of the employees, nobody, there is nobody to talk for them. Um, I think they are in a tough spot because um, uh, the trade unions normally would have advocated for more pay. But now in an environment where the cost of living is high, even more pay may not help the, the workers. And, and indeed, the trade union um, closed gaps with the government because they wanted to have the relevancy. And you remember famously, the TSC uh, teachers were told, we'll pay you in full if you want to any deductions to send to the trade union, please send them from your own account. And that's really weakened the trade union. But yeah. I think um, with modernization and a tough labor market, uh, trade unions had to start drawing close to the government, but obviously right now it's almost uh, counter-logical for them then to be against the ruling state. All right. Yes. Uh, well, that is uh, the uh, front page of the Daily Nation. Uh, I believe that they are transition us into the topic of conversation, and that is Mambo Ia Mafuta. In fact, if when I flip over uh, to the editorial cartoon today on page um, uh, 13... Uh, of the daily nation it has to do with just that and here we go a uh, fuel pricing and uh somebody in there is 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 uh, reading the bottom-up economic model that is appears to be president william ruto they've driven off a cliff and uh, it says keep driving uh is the editorial uh cartoon there 
But uh, what I'm curious what you make of the public statements that have been made with regard to the rising cost of fuel. We have David D saying the chickens have come home to roost. We have been boring recklessly. It is time to pay the piper. Uh, we have uh, Dennis Itumbi and uh, talking about global shocks. Uh, EPRA says the landing cost of fuel is high. You know, Professor Exen Iraqi. I wish I could good I could talk good so I like you. <laughs> <laughs> that that's, that seems to be a secret talent. But but I think I'm liking uh, I'm not liking this debate mm -hmm. because these are seen officials in the government, but they are talking with the discordant. One is saying this, other one is saying that. But the reality is that time is times are hard, and I want to demonstrate with an example over the weekend. I travelled to the countryside, I not disclose the destination, mm -hmm. and I went to see some folks of mine. And uh, one elderly looked at me and asked, asked me, from Nairobi up to here, umechoma mafuta ya beigani, ya, ya how much? And I gave her the figure. And she asked me, why did you send me that money? <laughs> okay, it looks funny because meeting people and sending money are two different things. But it was a demonstration of how people are feeling the cost of living. She feels that instead of just burning all this money with the fear, which is very expensive, just give it to me. But let's go to the heart of the matter. Why are we hearing different voices from different officials in the government? I think uh, the moment of truth is now that all the promises we made in the run up to the last year's polls have not been fulfilled. We promised the high local, we, we said we are going to bring down the cost of living, the cost of fuel, the cost of everything. But that has not happened. I don't blame them entirely because if you look at the external environment, it has not been very good. The price of fuel has been going up. OPEC have been coming together and saying we are going to reduce the supply so that the price goes up. But I think they are not, I know the external environment has not been very bad, has, has been very bad. But even in the internal environment has also been very, has not, not also been very good. Mm -hmm. The rains have not performed as expected. And let's also agree that uh, the government needs money and one of the easiest sources of money happens to be fuel tax. So when the government says they cannot do <coughs> anything about the cost of fuel, I don't think they are sincere because in my opinion, tax is a very big component of fuel. Why can't they re remove the tax from fuel and the price goes down? So, so the, the, the discordant voices are telling you there's a problem somewhere. And the problem is they made promises, the environment has changed. They have no control over the external environment, but they cannot tell. If you, if you talk to a person on the streets and ask him why the fuel is going up, he doesn't know about opaque or the Middle East. He'll tell you the government is responsible. And that's why I've been saying, if I was in the government today, I would set the price free. Let the market work. Then if the market goes up, if the price goes up, you bring the market, not the government. So maybe at the time we fully liberalize the fuel prices and we see what happens. Mm. <clears throat> but I'm not happy to hear somebody saying this, somebody saying that, and in the same government. Okay. Uh, Kijay, you're looking like you have uh, something to add to what Oh, yes, I, I, I certainly do. I said, uh -huh. um, Certainly, I know in government there is a principle of collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I feel we should never quieten voices that are divergent because, um, you know, in the past there was always one song. And really, if you examine some of these statements, there is some element of truth. Because mm -hmm. someone said, talked of Harvard gra graduates of medicine, you know, they they you know they even lose patience but 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 i think what comes out bad is the arrogance when somebody says you know let's uh, mine oil and we know we have oil in kenya but let me let me <laughs> verbatim let me read it to you verbatim That's he fine. said suchimbe kisima yako suchimbe kisima yako you know mm. there are a lot of kenyans and i have a lot of solidarity and pain for the poor because there's somebody on the what they call the bread line and that is not a solution to you because we, we, our, us as citizens, we look to government to provide us with solutions. And there was a promise made, although it's a political promise for the campaign of lowering cost and making us to afford to live. But when things turn out this way, I, I think we need to be wise because right now from, I'm an investment consultant, if the shilling continues to depreciate, and it will if we have what we call externally imported inflation, the very debt we are trying to pay will not be able to pay because if the government has to pay dollars for a dollar at 170, 200, that increases how much we are to pay. But different voices are good, 
Um, um, I think uh, the, the fear that the Dr. Devin D said the economic model may not work, uh, that has some reality in it. Uh, I don't know whether if we quieten these voices and I've heard some people say these people should be fired, whether if we ever go to the ditch, anybody will ever say. And remember, the people talking have a long history of activism and even firing them may not cause them to shut up. We, we always need discordant voice. I, I also really appreciate somebody with a different opinion. However, maybe the tone may be different. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could say the same thing but use different words. And maybe that's what hurtful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we are joined as well. You may not uh, see him in studio, but he is with us. And that is uh, Abraham, Dr. Abraham Rugo Muriu. And he is the Country Manager International Budget Partnership. Uh, Kenya, good to have you with us. Uh, I'm curious, Dr. Is this a case of, because you hear the C, Energy CS Davis Chichi saying some of these things really are beyond the, our control. There's really nothing the government can do. Or, so is this a case of incompetence or truly uh, the government's hands are tied? Uh, thank, you, thank you. It's a good morning. I'm sorry I couldn't be able to join you in studio. Uh, my take of this is that one, this is not a surprise. We saw ourselves getting here. Uh, what uh, Dr. David D and other colleagues are saying within government is just a confirmation uh, of uh, what has always been coming. The past rhetoric has been, no, 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 you guys are exaggerating it. You're trying to make it look bigger than it is. Uh, but this is just the reality. Um, if you remember in our past conversation, I did bring you to speed that even before the elections last year, uh, a couple of uh, organizations and individuals did even meet the, the current president and presented to him the kind of picture, the kind of reality that he is walking into. Uh, and therefore, one would have expected uh, that uh, at the beginning, there would be an appreciation. The kind of language we are having now, I wish that was the language that was started off immediately. I know it's not politically, uh, uh, very uh, exciting, but I, I think that honesty would have been more valuable than where now we find ourselves. I, I don't think uh, we would be in an any different place uh, uh, right now, say for one thing. If uh, we had stuck to the root of not trying to do everything that had been promised and stuck to the root of reducing government expenditure, uh, because the costs of fuel were definitely going to go up. But if we had a buffer, because that's what we currently don't have. Currently, what we don't have is that we don't have a buffer. You don't have any extra resources there. You know, the maneuver space is completely limited because of the, how much you are paying to public debt. So, but it's not a surprise. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a surprise at all that we find ourselves here. It's just that the rhetoric has been saying, no, 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 everything is fine. You guys, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't say it's bad. Uh, but now coming to an opposition. But secondly, I think what is most concerning, and I completely share that perspective uh, with uh, Professor Iraqi, is that these are the very people who are responsible for day-to-day -day policy. Every time we have raised a concern that we don't have a coherent policy direction, we don't have uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a guiding framework as to why we, for instance, what is the guiding framework around the kind of taxes we are raising left, right, side? It is true that, yes, we are in an agreement uh, with the IMF. Uh, and we can talk about, we'll talk about that a bit more because I think, uh, you know, the sovereignty of the nation also needs to be upheld. Uh, it's true there's an, there's an agreement on fiscal consolidation, but we also cannot say that, uh, you know, the questions of accountability, the questions of how we use our public resources are also a matter of the agreement uh, in, in that sense. So that's my take uh, about uh, the current state. No surprise, uh, but how we have gotten here, I think, is what is then coming to, to haunt us. All right. So we will get more into these issues, including uh, the role of the IMF, uh, whether this is a perfect storm with OPEC, uh, Prof has told us uh, they reduced supply to push the prices up, uh, whether this is a question of the, the Kenya shilling versus the dollar, uh, whether this is an issue of taxation. Uh, we were told that the road development levy, removal of the road development levy, the 3.5%, would offset the 16% VAT. But then I have been reading and I have seen that uh, the VAT may go up to 18% on fuel beginning July 2024. All of that on the other side of this break.
by Fred Omundi. Dial star 812 star 798 hash. Skiza na Nation. Hello and welcome to Kikao, your weekly authoritative program on Africa's agriculture. For many years, humans have used uh, traditional breeding methods such as selective breeding and crossbreeding to get desirable traits in plants and animals. You are able to move genes from one organism to another through crossing. So mm -hmm. what breeders have always done is to cross one parent with another in the hope that the offspring will carry the good character from here and the good character from here. This week we focus on a subject that evokes fear in some people but in others opportunities. We are talking about genetically modified organisms or products better known as GMOs. Germany's fall from grace hit a new low after an embarrassing 4-1 home loss to Japan. It what proved to be Hansi Flick's last game as manager. With Flick removed from his post after three consecutive defeats, a familiar face has stepped in to lead Die Mannschaft on an interim basis. Butter's birthday month and you can enjoy free shopping of up to 500 bob. Offer starts at 2,499 only. Visit your nearest Butter store today. For all your sporty news updates. This is the first time I'm actually holding a sword. It's fun conversations. Tell me something, why Jersey 14? That was Thierry Henry. You know, this Jersey 14 where my mom bought me uh, his Jersey. Great entertainment. Reap cracking laughter. <laughs> yeah, that's our director. And insightful banter. Tell us about that rivalry with the Kani Simbine. When you get to track, there's no friendship. Elid, what's your favorite food? Favorite food is yes. Akali. Join us every Monday at 10 p.m. with NTV Sports Gurus Bernard Ndong and James Wakabe. Sport On on NTV, your home of sports. Natalia is mine. What's wrong? Diego. I tried. But you seem to be worse than an iceberg. Why did you keep from me the fact that you have a twin brother? Alberto told me everything. You're hurting me. Diego, you're really Stop hurting me! Stop calling me like that! Tell me why! You are hurting me now! Let go of me! Head over heels. This is where you're throwing money down the drain. How? On this cleaning product. Impossible. Hapic Tenex. When other cleaners blow away, Hapic Tenex's viscous formula in only one round of application gives you sparkling, clean toilet. Hapic, ten times better cleaning than other cleaning products. And great savings too. It's Butter's birthday month and you can enjoy free shopping of up to 500 bob. Offer starts at 2,499 only. Visit your nearest Butter store today. Alright, welcome back to AM Life. And we are asking, what is the state of the economy, right? Is the economy stable? Or are we on the brink? In fact, I think the terminology uh, that was used by David Dean in his tweet in response to Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi, senior counsel, was it, it is a cancer that we have been feeding and it will be painful, um, the attempt to cut out said cancer. And this is um, in relation to the debt we have accumulated and corruption and all of that that is tied in. But I'm curious, um, uh, Professor Exen Iraqi, um, Kinga says dissenting voices are not necessarily a bad thing. But what message does it send to foreign investors? The president has been in the U.S. meeting these tech firms, uh, Apple, you know, and, and uh, SpaceX, 
and encouraging them to you know invest in Kenya we had our deputy president in Colombia and he told us just yesterday that he's now back in the country they're wooing investors but then you have a, a government that is speaking at odds what message does that send let's, let's go back to about one year ago when uh, Kenya Kwanza came to power and I remember the readers saying in six months we are going to fix the economy and they said about one year now it appears it's going to be more than one year so what, one of the most important things in economics is not even the reality but the sentiments and the emotions that whatever you say the, the people uh, the, what sentiments people have or the emotions so when we have people saying different things and in the same government then any investor trying to come here will be asking what's the reality on the ground and they may say i'm not going to come until the, the four the, the political and economic four careers and that's why my colleague said it's very important to have a clear policy direction so that when i'm coming to this country i know exactly where i'm getting into investors don't don't like surprises but i think what is coming out clearly whether it is from the investors point of view from the citizens point of view or from political point of view is that we have finally faced the economic reality all these things we have been talking around have come home to roost, to roost and what is the reality is that we don't have something like switch on economics you know when you go to vote you vote and in about 24 hours time you change the readers and MC loses a seat you get a new president you get everybody new depending on how they, they campaigned but in economics you cannot do that you cannot put a switch and say the prices come down or prices goes up or prices stabilize it takes a long time and we have to make hard decisions and the hard decisions are complicated by IMF because IMF is saying you must do A, B, C, D. But the A, B, C, D you are going to do must face the economic and political reality on the ground. Because when IMF makes, tells you to make certain decisions like moving subsidies, we have the people on the ground, the people who suffer because of prices going up. So I think this, what is happening now is good in the long run because now people must make hard decisions. People must stop postponing decisions. They must make hard decisions. For example, can we now start cutting any wastage in governments? So that instead of now raising the prices or raising the taxes, we stabilize because we are having another source of income. So that's one hard decision you have to make. We must also have to make hard decisions about uh, the wages and salaries because a very big chunk of our money goes to wages and salaries, whether it's the county level or the government level. That's another way to reduce the cost. And then we, have, we must confront corruption because I think that's an issue that keeps on coming back and back. That there's a lot of money that is wasted through corruption and so on. So I think the silver lining in all this discordance is that people will have to make hard decisions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're a politician, it doesn't matter whether you're an investor, it doesn't matter whether you're not a citizen. The only problem is that the collateral damage might be me and you. Because we are not shielded like uh, people, people with big salaries, whether you're government and so on, you're shielded. But the people on the streets are not shielded by, 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 by savings. They don't have savings. They live from day to mouth. So we are going to see, we are waiting to see very hard decisions made by the government. And those decisions should be pro people, pro Wanjiko. And uh, the voters are waiting. When I talk to the voters, they are saying uh, things are, are bad, but we are waiting for 2027. And that to me is very bad news because people are telling you we are losing hope. We are, we, let's wait five years into the future, four years into the future. But they must live for today. So in summary, we are waiting for hard economic and political decisions because the reality is with us. Okay. Have we been sold kinywa hot air? And I ask whether to me was you are a moto kwa sababu several promises were made, right? Yes. What all this government to government deal would see the, the exchange rate come down to 120 shillings, okay. even lower to 115 shillings. To kambi wa sikuingine bei ya cylinder ya gas itashuka, itafika 500 to 300 uh, shillings. Bado, uh, we were told, as in the promises abound. The promises are good because they give us hope for tomorrow and we can wait, wait out for a day or a week as we wait for the promises to be realized. But I have to say, I'm an investment consultant and real investments, people don't wait for the fog to clear. They, in fact, there is a common saying that make money while the blood is still on the streets, you know. It, it's a rogue saying, but... Um, We've seen multinationals relocate in this part of the world even when the economic and political risk is very high. And those are the people that tend to 
get a sized return. On the other hand, I I'm always wary of IMF because these are, you know, highly educated academicians who have never probably had the um, the challenge of sleeping on an empty stomach or buying unga at uh, 200 or close to 150 because the textbook economics in the ground because every country is unique uh, the dynamics are unique the economy is unique in fact in economics and finance there is the economic cycle the person on the streets uh, doesn't understand why the government should offer subsidies and indeed there are no subsidies because if for every liter of fuel the tax element is almost uh, over 80 shillings it's over 80 shillings returning the same money or not taxing at the same level will cause the fuel to go down below the psychological level of 200 because there's uh, an element of uh, desperation and, lo and loss of hope and as professor iraki has said the sentiment is more important and that's why regardless of what we do if the political and economic sentiment is not positive the shilling will continue losing ground and that's really bad because for every shilling that um, you know, uh, weekends against the dollar. Our debt is balloon, ballooning because most of it is in dollars, euros, and pounds. So I, I feel um, it's very important that the political class get to the ground that they show solidarity with the poor people because uh, even uh, there was pressure all along for, you know, maybe you may not have been uh, uh, there when they had structural adjustments programs in 19. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 80s mm -hmm. and the pain they brought to this country honestly we are still recovering unfortunately uh, from a economics point of view when prices go up they don't easily come down we say that prices are downward inelastic the prices go up easily but they don't come down so i think we need to be a bit firmer probably remove the bureaucrats from their high towers and come and meet our needy people in the corners of this world who now have to work, have to, the children have to be out of school uh, because the parents can no longer uh, afford. And maybe finally, the vulnerability of the common citizen makes the, the theoretical economic model sometimes unworkable and, and the effect affects people. For example, people look at wages of how much people earn and uh, maybe you earn 50,000, 10,000, 100,000. What the, the IMF people may not understand in World Bank is that that money is being taxed so many times as you pay the black tax. People are supporting people. Where, where you park, you know when people see you, they'll ask you for 100 bucks because you park, know that they are of offering any service or security. And therefore that tax finds, um, it's also spent when you know, when this person goes to the shop. So we, people feel the pressure, the, our spending is not as it would be in the developed world, and therefore there is need to be gentle with our policies. Okay. <coughs> um, Dr. Abraham, my question to you, because uh, Kenya has raised the question of IMF, is are we in receivership? I, that, I think that's a hard question uh, because uh, we have not first we have not declared bankruptcy, uh, so we have not gotten to a point where we have uh, you know been proven that we are you know we, we are insolvent in the sense that we are not able. But it's an important question you ask because uh, when you think about uh, receivership, it means that uh, I, that's when an institution is not able to meet its obligations. Uh, it's not able to handle its liabilities, its assets are dwindling. I don't think that's where we are uh, as a country uh, in every sense. However, we are in a very tight squeeze uh, because our daily obligations, so look at it for instance this way, that uh, this year alone uh, we are paying out of the 250, and I want just to bring this down completely, out of the 250 shillings that we are pay, we, we, we are going to raise, we are expecting to raise as ordinary tax uh, before even any further changes are made, 165 of that is already going to paying debt alone. So, so 165 is out, uh, and therefore that leaves you just with about 85 shillings to be able to meet all your obligations. And this is against a budget. Uh, of uh, 370 uh, as, as it was. So you already see the kind of gap, the kind of uh, deficit that we are, we, are, we are dealing with. 
In that sense, then, we now get ourselves actually into a debt distress uh, situation because if we, without that kind of demand, that kind of pressure, your wiggle room, I talked about it in the earlier point, that your wiggle room uh, is, not, uh, is, is not good. So where do we do? Already we were in a program, uh, uh, the, the, the fiscal consolidation program that we talk about, which had to do with some aspects of austerity, uh, uh, raising more revenue. Perhaps just to explain, so when you have a deficit, uh, the, the only way to get yourself into um, into a stable kind of uh, you know public uh, public spending space is one you either reduce your expenditure uh, which is what the fiscal consolidation conversation a good portion of it is that is not an option that the current government has has gone for so they they opted to you know keep the expenditure uh, at business as usual kind of a, a, a state two you raise taxes uh which is now seemingly the the preferred uh, uh model of you know try and raise more taxes uh you know uh, and, and perhaps fill the gap and three borrow uh so, so those are three and, and when you think about it borrowing has its limits because now the kind of situation that we find ourselves in the fact that the cost of borrowing is also going up very highly and perhaps to disabuse the idea that uh, our biggest problem is our external debt uh, they were our external borrowing. Yes, we have a challenge there, especially because of the currency fluctuation. But our biggest challenge, and let's face it, fellow Kenyans, is actually uh, internal. We are borrowing. The last borrowing we did uh, was, at, I think, uh, the coupon rate was about 17%. Uh, now, at 17%, that already puts you into a lot of, and this is short term borrowing. You know, we're talking of, of borrowing that is at less than five years. Uh, and, and most of it, when it goes so far, is about 10, 10 years. So, so, so with that, then you already are finding yourself uh, in, 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 a, in a fix. And going to the IMF to be able to help you stabilize, you know, or be able to deal, uh, to deal, to deal with the situations, then it means that the IMF has a call, has a call to make. So I'm not quite sure the language of receivership, uh, uh, not, 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 not perhaps in writing, not perhaps uh, in, 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 in its real, real sense, but it's true that we are getting to a place where we are struggling to meet our day our day-to-day -day obligations and therefore if to answer you right i don't think we're in a receivership per se uh it's just that we find ourselves in a very tight 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 spot all right so we're not in receivership per se it's just that we find ourselves in a very tight spot do you share those sentiments professor I share those sentiments with him <clears throat> but uh, before i react to that uh, I, I i i want uh, the right of reply to my colleague sitting on the left here mm -hmm. he, he talked of people called theoretical economists uh, and I think I want to dissuade him from believing that uh, academicians are theoreticians mm -hmm. and we just deal with theories. The truth is that we are realists. We are investors, we are entrepreneurs, and we said we meet ordinary people on the street. So we know what is happening around. We go and meet, ta we pay for taxis, we meet the newsies. So we know exactly what happens on the ground. Maybe the economists who may not understand what happens on the ground might be from IMF or World Bank and multilateral organizations who have never lived in this country. But for us who live in this country as economists, we know exactly what happened in this country, and we see it happen every day. And then, uh, since he's a very young man, let me remind him that I'm not that old, but I came to face to face with the uh, structural adjustment, adjustment programs. Mm -hmm. I think it was also driven by IMF, and it was not very nice. In fact, those of us who are old enough can see some parallelism be between what is happening now mm -hmm. and what happened during IMF, mm -hmm. during the SAP, mm -hmm. structural adjustment programs. And IMF pushed the same, very similar policies that the government needs to set the prices free. I remember a lot of, at that time a lot of commodities prices were controlled mm -hmm. but after SAP they went up. A lot of services that were free started getting paid for, education, medi medical services and so on. So it was not a very exciting period particularly politically and uh, if you remember when President Moy was the president I don't think he was not, he was not very happy with IMF. Mm. And uh, finally let me re react to your statement whether we are in uh, receivership. I am one of Kenya's leading optimists. So even if it is things are very bad, I will never say that Kenya is in receivership. Mm -hmm. Because who is going to receive it? Who will be the receiving manager if Kenya is in receivership? Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to do is not worry so much about being in receivership, but seeing how we can reverse that so that we can become profitable. We can take care of our obligations, whether it is salaries, whether it is wages, whether it is investment, whether it is development, whether it is taking kids to school, whether it is taking care of education, all these are the national or government obligations. We need to take care of that. So I don't think we are in receivership, in my opinion, because 
we are still an, uh, an operating entity. What we should be asking is, if we are near receivership, so, so much that we are bringing that debate, how can we reverse it? And I think that's, the more, that's where the debate should focus on. We are in this situation, it is not a very good situation, how do we reverse it? Mm. Whether you are the government, whether you are an investor, or whether you are an individual. That's what we should be discussing. I don't think things are that bad. We can still uh, turn things around. Kenya has gone through worse crisis. We had SAP, we had COVID, we, we had the economic crisis of 2008, and we went through all that. We even had Goldenberg. So if we can uh, look at the resilience of the Kenyan people and harness it, there's no reason why we cannot get out of this. Because being worried, being a pessimist, will not solve the national problem. Okay. So but optimism should be our current cry. But my, my, okay, so uh, Dr. Abraham Rugu has talked about, uh, several times he's mentioned this thing, fiscal consolidation, right? And then the three of you have, I don't know that Dr. Abraham has mentioned the SAPs, but at least the, both, the two of you have um, talked about the structural adjustment programs under uh, the program. Is it programs or program? Program. 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 Yes. And uh, the MOI regime what's the distinction between where we are now and what happened then Can you okay know? okay um maybe uh, let me tell the professor that he's very respected for being a practical realist i'm not referring to him ah, very good. indeed very good. Say, say that if, again if, say that again. if, <laughs> if they were relying on his advice we would be very far uh -huh. uh, because i i know his journey and the work he has done which is exceptional and i read his articles once in a while so he feels the pain of the masses. I'm also a perennial optimist. Uh, yes, but, but um, the, the thing is, and it's fair to be reasonable, the structural adjustment programs uh, came in at a very painful time when Kenya was being ostracized by the external world because of uh, political agitation for multi-party democracy. And as an economic uh, historian myself, the interest rates were high even the treasury bills were up to 80 percent uh, that time yes believe it or not and um, the, our currency lost v value in a very very big way and big countries like brazil argentina have gone through hyperinflation leave alone the zimbabwe that we know and you know my my fear is that some of these institutions have not had a very good track record in africa um, in fact, I, we always say, let them tell us one country where their policies have developed. And yet at the same time, uh, the good book says that the borrower uh, is a slave to the lender. Mm -hmm. While we have this debt to pay, and our in, in the international markets, last time the government uh, did a book run for the euro bond, it was up to 16, 17% for the you know, for dollar denominated debt, which is very, very punitive. Locally, our treasury bond issues to raise funding and treasury bills, a lot of them have been undersubscribed and issuers are, are asking for very high interest rate. So where does that leave us? It's taxation. But the challenge with taxation is that up to, there is what we call peak taxation. There's a point that reaches that people see there is no value in working more, where now they choose rest or they choose to go to other things that are not uh, exposed to taxation. And, and therefore the fear is, as we tax people more, the businesses, the individuals in business, the employees, a time reaches where extra productivity may not be seen as valuable. For example, in Kenya, when you tax people for NHAF and NSSF, they see it as tax, because what counts is what hits my account. It doesn't matter that NSSF, I can potentially claim it when I retire. And therefore, you see there is reluctance to employ from the employer. So my own view is that um, uh, tax is fine, and I don't think people are fundamentally opposed to paying taxes, but be gentle in its introduction. This is only the first year. Why, why couldn't we roll out the taxation um, regime gently so that we grow the economy? Because, because there's more plant. 
for July 2024. <laughs> yes. There is the vehicle circulation tax, which is uh, wealth tax. Yes. Uh, so you'll be paying a minimum, and then everybody will pay a standard, and then after that, depending on the engine capacity. And then there is the carbon tax. There is more. There is so, more. So, so maybe this is the so general let's, approach. Let's differentiate. <laughs> there are tax proposals mm -hmm. from Treasury that have been you know, the media has had a field day around last week. There are those already in law. Mm -hmm. NSSF has to go up by law for the next four years until it reaches a certain threshold. Um, and, and people regard that as, as tax, unfortunately. However, my big interest as a citizen of this country and who wishes the best for this country is that we should be careful about productivity growing the economy because when the cake expands, we, the government can still achieve its uh, physical consolidation or paid debt under a, big, uh, under a bigger cake. So there are more people to tax, businesses are more. And you know really, the idea that we can tax high earning people is very risky for our country because we have a lot of international NGOs here. And when they are making decisions, NGOs and companies, do we relocate to Kenya as our headquarters? These are people who earn a lot. And they're able to go to the, our cafeterias, our movies, hire people here. And therefore, as they hire people, they also create spending power. Any policy that doesn't create an uh, expansion to our economic cake as a country, I think we should be very careful, regardless of our economic and political position. Mm. I know on that one, Prof will agree with you, because several, uh, we've had a discussion around taxing into prosperity. And he's been of the view that you'd rather cut tax to spur expenditure, uh, spending and all of that. But I'll come back to you. Uh, and I've not changed that position. You've not changed that position. I'll come back to you on that, Prof. Yeah. But first, uh, Dr. Abraham, you, you know, you've already told us we have very little wiggle room. Uh, where the IMF mm. is concerned, uh, but perhaps you could tell us what is the distinction between where we are now, this fiscal consolidation and this structural adjustment uh, programs that we went through in the late late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, um, I, I think the big the big the big uh, uh, difference is that uh, first of all, let, let's start with the similarity. The similarity is that in both cases it was a process of trying to. Uh, ensure that government can be able to uh, address its uh, its obligations. Uh, of course, uh, what does the IMF uh, and the World Bank care is that the monies that we have borrowed uh, and uh, the participation of the economies that they represent, who basically are the major shareholders uh, within those those banks, can be paid, can be uh, you know. Uh, so, so in other words, all the borrowing that we are going, so we, their biggest concern is that we are going we are going concern. Uh, but secondly, is that they are also a bank at the end of the day. So they also would like to uh, uh, have as many of, I mean, as many countries as, as practically possible borrowing and on a process where basically they are almost dependent, dependent on them uh, in, in one way or another. And I say that with a lot of uh, with a lot of respect, but also knowing that we have engaged with them as civil society uh, organization. So, 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 so that's that's the, that's the core part. Now that relates both to the well, the structural adjustment program because when you remember the structural adjustment programs were also a form of a fiscal consolidation. The sense being, what is fiscal consolidation? Basically, is that you need to be on a path that is sustainable uh, in the long run. A path that is sustainable both to be able to pay your debts, a path that is sustainable for you to be able to uh, to, 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 to do the things. So at the bottom of it and in the, you know, in the language of it, uh, one would argue that fiscal consolidation is the very thing we should be doing even without entering into any program uh, uh, as it were. Then a big part of it, remember, was in reducing the wage bill. So the government spending is was a big one. So, so state corporations were rationalized, in other words, were reduced in size. Uh, people are entrenched and uh, or given the golden handshake as it was called then um, and, and, a lot, and a lot of a lot of that basically was the essence uh, of remember it also came at the background of uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, new public management where the argument was that you actually can run government almost like private sector you know you can you can improve the efficiencies within government by checking uh, both your you know how much you're putting in and the value for money in terms of you know the the, the return Hands on investments as, 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 as it were. That was the structure adjustment. What is the fiscal consolidation program right now? The fiscal consolidation program right now 
come as comes at the background of a, of a time when Kenya has been um, you know Kenya has been you know, written upwards in the sense of moving from a low uh, income country to uh, a middle, uh, to, a, to a lower middle income country so it is considered a middle income what that means is that then the 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 the, uh, the incomes uh, per capita or the basically the income per person uh, across the country is considered to be up Kenya now ceases to be to benefit from programs that are basically considered for the poor uh, you know and, and struggling countries uh, as it were and then for the fiscal consolidation program right now as it is also has to do with reducing the cost of government and therefore uh, state corporations uh, or state-owned enterprises are a big part of what needs to be rationalized in terms of reducing the cost of government raising taxes to be able to be more dependent you know to be able to be more uh, uh, you know sustainable and in return then the imf gives you a facility that basically almost creates a confidence uh, a level within the international market of the kind of facilities that you can be able uh, to because what, what the IMF does that the IMF does not give you a lot of money what it gives you is that it tries to create you know some some uh, some confidence as it were uh, for you to be able to access you know the international markets and be able to you know to, to stabilize things in that process then inevitably they get into you know your domestic uh, uh, policy making because then they are involved in what the treasury is deciding uh, you agree on uh, what kind of uh, and therefore when you hear cabinet secretaries talking about oh we made a covenant we made an agreement uh, which then brings the question about the sovereignty of the country um, uh, and, and at what point must we draw the line as a country and say that beyond here we are going to run but we are not doing ourselves any service because uh, any good because even the things we should be doing without any program uh, without any fiscal consolidation program for instance like addressing corruption addressing wastage within government you know uh, reducing our own expenditure to be within our means we are not living by it uh, so 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 in almost like on one hand you know you you don't want the imf to interfere with your you know with your with your day-to-day -day, uh, programming with your day-to-day -day policy making on the other hand you're also not living you know uh, to the full measure uh, of level of responsibility so i hope that explains just the fiscal consolidation program that we are in right now and raising taxes is one of it raising our, our taxes to be able just to meet our obligations is a key part uh, is a key part of that agreement of course then it comes with you must reduce subsidies on consumption uh you must remove uh you know all these uh support which are questionable because some of the countries that have grown and that we look up to in europe in the u.s mm had survived with subsidies you know so of course subsidizing production as it were uh, supporting the vulnerable supporting the the weak uh, but now that they are in themselves a bit more stable they don't want the other countries and in the same discussion is what is happening within the climate the climate world but i hope that that does clarify just what what kind of program we signed and with that we get an extended what we call an extended uh, credit facility uh, and then an extended fund facility uh, to be able to draw a bit more resources but when you look at the resources we are drawing from them they are very small compared to our total budget you know they are less than 10 percent of our total budget uh, as it were thanks okay but if the resources we draw from them are very small compared to our total budget then why do they have so much say uh professor x and iraqi also it appears that, that's, a, that's an interesting observation because if I can take him back about uh, structural adjustment programs, mm -hmm. the big major difference between then and now are probably one or two. One, we had a very powerful president during Moyera because we, had, we didn't have a new constitution. And number two, uh, apart from a, a very powerful constitution, we didn't have multipartism. So we didn't have all the people now who, who have varying voices. So if you say something, somebody say, no, we can do it this way. We didn't have that opposition. So it was one way. So that made a very big difference because the political constitution wasn't a very big issue because uh, if, if there was any opposition, it was very muted. So as a president, as a leader, you, you could make decisions easily compared with now. But you, you, back to your question, why IMF some, seems to be so powerful now? Remember, one of the big uh, decisions that the new government made was we need to move away from the borrowing to taxation. So we don't want to borrow because, because of a factor nobody is talking about very loudly, the Chinese factor. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why IMF has been very, very uh, talking about IMF is the Western factor. We are seeing Kenya's road by slowly moving from the Eastern orbit to the Western orbit. Mm -hmm. And one way to 
to be friendly with the people is to borrow money from them. So we are not talking about China anymore. We are talking about IMF and associated institutions. And, and maybe this is one, one way we need, to, we need to think some of the things that are annoying us as Kenyans. People say we don't want to borrow. But one way to reduce taxes would be to borrow. Now, I've always said there's nothing wrong with borrowing as, as long as you put that money into the right, into the right use. Remember, when you bring taxes, they're instantaneous. Mm -hmm. But when you borrow, you can wait for some time before you, 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 you pay back or you can pay into the future. So we need probably to think of uh, our anger over borrowing. We borrow a bit because that borrowing can also reduce the effect of taxation. Mm -hmm. On IMF uh, being very prominent, I agree with, the More with uh, Moreu that uh, we need to think more about our, our sovereignty because we vote and we vote for political leaders. Mm -hmm. I don't think we vote for those institutions. We vote for political leaders. So at the end of the day, they should be the key decision makers. They should be the people telling us this is the path we should take, not the other people that are not connected with us in any, in any way. So when I go to vote, I vote for my MCA, my senator, my women rep, my president, and the other officials. Those are the people I should be holding accountable, not IMF or anybody else. So I think if you allow me to add something uh -huh. little, the, I've talked to farmers in the developed world and they get massive subsidies from government. Indeed, I remember talking one to Europe, tells me it's m more profitable for me not to farm than to farm. Uh, and, and remember these institutions, you know, as uh, uh, Mr. Moreu said, Dr. Moreu said, they're in business. They are owned by, you know, shareholders and the largest shareholders are foreign governments who themselves, during COVID, the American government was sending checks to people's houses. Only if you wake up, you find a thousand dollars for you to go cash in the bank. And that's how the America was able to come out of COVID slowly. Yes, the inflation went up in the US, but now uh, then it's gone down and inflation is going up right now. That's what we call um, monetary easing. They sent billions to companies. American corporates got billions. Even right now, they just need to apply and the, you know, Uncle Sam will send money to you for free, not repairable. As long as, and the way they do it is very interesting because they target companies with employees. If you have a hundred employees, a thousand employees, um, keep them. Uh, it, they call them very interesting programs like employ, uh, employment sustainable program. Also remember that in the developed world, where where IMF thinking comes from mainly, they they subsidize their citizens living through benefits. If you're not working, uh, you get housing allowance, child allowance. Um, you know, if you get a child, you get paid. You know, how interesting is that? You get housing allowance, unemployment allowance, and all sorts of allowances to cushion the citizen, disability allowance. These are just money you find to spend. And, and therefore, when then um, we are rated, as uh, Dr. Moreau said, as a middle-income uh, country, and how they do it is they see the overall income of the country, which does not speak to the income distribution, because we know that our country... Um, probably the bottom two million people are very vulnerable. People would die out of lack of food, something that probably you cannot imagine in the West because they have all these soup kitchens and all these um, um, NGOs that help them. Then we begin to miss the point. My solidarity is with that person, that single mother on the bread line, that person who has to work from Kibera uh, to go and try and uh, sneak his ID in the industry area so that it's picked, so that the name is called, so that they have food for their family. So, as uh, Professor Raki is saying, even as we follow what IMF is saying, because what IMF does to answer your question, it's create confidence, just like uh, Dr. Moreau said, so that other borrowers kind of, uh, can uh, ride on the back of that confidence um, that the government is on the right path, so please lend us money. And we know right now that the Europeans who used to lend us uh, in the 80s are uh, dealing with their own struggles. And therefore, as Professor Raki is saying, it doesn't matter. I think it shouldn't matter so much that we get help uh, from the East. And at the same time, we try also get help from the West. And I think with our president now being called, uh, being liked very much by the West, then um, they would help us. But hopefully, let them write checks to us because if this continues, what happens when the economy is very much affected, crime goes up, 
um, factories close, uh, the taxation goes down, and therefore, and therefore we do not invest for their children. And employment, which is a key indicator uh, of the economic growth, goes down. So okay. my prayer and my hope is that the facing West will cause this country to grow. There is pain in between because IMF has to give us the impromptu, the stamp of approval. But in the, in the East, which apparently too much borrowing from the East is what put us in this trouble, they have the money and they're okay. very wealthy and they can actually lend us. All right. So um, speaking of borrowing, I just want to make a quick note so that we can take a break. Uh, Julian Zamboko, uh, our business and tech editor Nation Media Group, tells us that the government of Kenya backpedals on its plan to slash domestic borrowing by 46%. This and more from the BROP 2023, BROP being the draft 2022 budget review and outlook paper and uh, he's highlighted uh, this uh, particular portion. Uh, the resulting financial deficit of 800.9 billion shillings, which is 4.4% of GDP in the 2024-2025 financial year, will be financed by a net external financing of 296.5 billion shillings, 1.6% uh, of GDP, and a net domestic financing of 504.3 billion shillings, which is 2.8% of GDP. So when we come back on the other side of this break, I just wanted to make quick mention of that. Uh, Moses Kuria told us that uh, we should brace for tough times. In fact, he talked about, is it, uh, yes, global crude prices are on an upward trajectory for planning purposes. Expect pump prices to go up by 10 shillings every month till February. Dr. Abraham Rugwa will be getting your thoughts on this. Uh, prediction, projection on the other side of the break. From pain. That moment when you start to get back to ordinary, and ordinary feels amazing. Whatever pain you're going through, release starts here. With Glovo, you've got the city at your fingertips. Hanging out na mnataka kuku fry, ama nyama choma, customized na ugali sosa. Order Glovo. Now you enjoy. Time to shower and running out of soap? Order Glovo, na wanze siku fresh. Ama simply treat family nzima with a sweet surprise. Mmm, delicious. With Glovo, unaweza a track order yako minute by minute. Download Glovo, order anything you want and receive it in minutes. Get ready to tantalize your taste buds and embark on a culinary journey with Pishi Bomba, the ultimate cooking show that brings the flavors of the world right into your living room. Tune in this Sunday at 6.30 p.m. with me, Claire Karatu, for a mouth-watering adventure. Pishi Bomba. Cook, eat, enjoy. Pishi Bomba in association with Ajab Home Baking Flour. Enjoy cooking your favorite meals with Ajab and freestyle your way to deliciousness. It's easy to knead, easy to roll and quick to prepare. Ajab Home Baking Flour. The flour that does more.
It's Bata's birthday month and you can enjoy free shopping of up to 500 bob. Offer starts at 2,499 only. Visit your nearest Bata store today. Alright, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to um, AM Live. Uh, no, no, you're fine. Uh, well, <laughs> he's, Kenya is suggesting that they be resident. They are technically, I just don't pay them. Um, but <laughs> uh, Moses Kuria posted uh, this and it, uh, it caused quite the fury. The global crude prices are on an upward trajectory. For planning purposes, expect pump prices to go up by 10 shillings every month till February. When the deputy president uh, came back uh, to the country, he posted this uh, yesterday. And um, this is what he said. I want to call upon fellow leaders, particularly those that our president uh, has given the privilege to serve Kenyans, to exercise caution in addressing their employer, the people of Kenya. It is insensitive to talk down to the people. And uh, he went on to say, I would like to remind them that although the people of Kenya did not employ them directly, they decisively elected William Ruto, who in turn appointed them cabinet secretaries and advisors. And hence, by virtue of this, they are employed by Kenyans. You do not address your employer with arrogance. Do so with humility and decorum. Kenyans, like the rest of the world, are going through difficult economic times and leaders should address them with sensitivity and empathy. And uh, responsible leaders should be sensitive and inspire hope to the people, uh, the hope for a better tomorrow, talking down to the people and demoralizing those who look up to them for solutions and a way out of the difficult situation they find themselves in is not good leadership, please. And he put this in, in caps, do not spite the people of Kenya. Um, uh, then Moses Kuria has woken up and he posted <laughs> that he is a truthful man. Here we go. August fuel stocks will land in October. The cost is well known and it's scientific. September shipments will land in November. Costs are also known. From there, we move to winter in the U.S. and expected stockpiles. And then the bilateral agreements between Saudis and Russia on the one side and China and India on the other hand, plus ongoing oil cuts. As minister responsible for private sector, mine is to advise business based on science, not truthful voodoo. So, eh, heh. My good uh, sir, Dr. Abraham Rugo, uh, David Ndi and Moses Kuria simply being truthful men, as the deputy president has many on occasion uh, branded himself. Of truth, man increasing. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's interesting. But having said that, um, I, I think honestly, uh, first of all, the, 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 the price of crude oil has been going up. Yeah, I think we've, we've uh, from around, um, from around 88, uh, we're just looking at the numbers here, uh, from uh, a low of about uh, 68, uh, you know, in July to a high of $91 uh, uh, currently. Uh, that's per barrel. So that, 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 that's significant. Uh, so that, that, that increase is definitely. Uh, and you know the fact that we actually do buy oil in uh, dollars and the fact that uh, our Kenya shilling against the dollar has been weakening uh, that can be discussed we can we can have a longer conversation then that means that um, as far as as long as we are going to be depending on this on 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 on, on crude oil which we are going to be depending on then there's a possibility there's a high possibility that uh, you know uh, and remember that what we order um, I think on that Moses Korea is right, really. What we order, we don't order it today and get it tomorrow. We order, you know, for, for future shipments and we order them at the prices of now. So that then even if <coughs> at the point of landing the prices have gone down, then we will still buy them. We still buy the oil at a, at a higher price. So yes, that is true. Uh, but, but I think as uh, Iraqi said, we can come all day uh, on matters around uh, how much you buy the crude oil and how that affects uh, you know the pump prices and that anybody would understand that what i struggle to understand is that we have many other alternatives in terms of energy in terms of renewable energy solar energy wind power that's a conversation that seems to you know always be you know hushed hushed down electricity part of it is still being produced using uh, diesel 
you know, uh, the, the independent power producers using diesel, uh, using petrol, uh, which then means that we are actually buying electricity sometimes at the cost uh, of uh, influenced by the cost of, 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 of oil. For me, I think that's, that's a misnomer. But the second one, is this decision to, to, buy, to buy a lot of the oil in credit, uh, which is a conversation you alluded to earlier, uh, which I think also may have contributed a bit to the current uh, spiraling of the dollar, uh, which basically means that uh, somebody knew, of course, at some point in September, there will have to be payment of oil uh, for six months, for the credit of six months, uh, and therefore they just hold on their dollars and they wait. They know somebody will be coming. Government will need to buy out you know, a lot of dollars to be able to, to pay uh, the, the, the oil. And therefore, you know, that kind of um, uh, arrangement perhaps explains why we are where we are right now uh, with the exchange rate uh, of, 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 of the dollars. So yes, they could be, they, they, they are speaking the truth, but they also have the possible, the power, you know, the cabinet secretary for trade, his job is not advisory, his job is policy making. Uh, his job is uh, actually implementing policy, you know, in terms of how do you cushion uh, the economy uh, from some of these, uh, some of these uh, challenges, not on Twitter, but through the meetings that are held, through decisions that are made in cabinet. So, so, so I, 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 this, on one hand, I feel like it's just political management, you know, trying to just keep us busy debating things uh, in one way or another. Uh, but on the other hand, I expect, you know, cabinet secretaries and advisors to the president in that uh, capacity to be able to actually make decisions, that decisions that help ameliorate, you know, the situation, that help address the critical challenges that we are talking about. Because the solutions are known, you know, uh, as I've just talked about, uh, the transition to renewable energy, you know, uh, you may not achieve everything everything right now, but you can move a lot of people uh, into renewable energy and therefore reduce uh, the kind of pressure that you have. You can, you know, we, you know wind power, geothermal power, you know, uh, if you feed all of it into the grid, which is, you know, almost an immediate thing you can do, uh, then you, 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 you bring down the cost of power and those alternatives then mean that you don't have to bear all the pressure based on the cost of uh, uh, crude oil. But yes. We, the global market is definitely on an upward trend, um, and it's likely going to be harder and harder to get to get crude oil uh, in a, you know in any cheaper cheaper price. Thanks. All right, and speaking of crude, there was this tweet, uh, another tweet of his and Prof. Uh, I'll, I want you to weigh in on, on something, not necessarily the tweet, uh, but whether it is truthful or not. Uh, the foremost problem, uh, Moses Kuya says, the foremost problem in our country is that only elitist agenda gets to the table of national discourse, discourse thanks to lazy media and idler KOTs. Mm -hmm. I agree with David D. Let's also talk about people who sleep hungry and when they rarely get, get a chance to eat, they can't get a toilet to excrete it. Excrete in, it is more important than your Uber and fish fingers. Is this really about Uber and fish fingers? And I ask that because Abraham pointed out something that's important. Our economy is powered heavily by diesel. So even if you reduce the, uh, the fertilizer cost, right, by way of subsidy, and the f diesel cost goes up, doesn't it cancel uh, the fertilizer subsidy? In essence, doesn't a cost in fuel affect everybody, whether you eat fish fingers or Uber, because even PSVs have told us, Bay, between 30 bob and 50 shillings, whether it is, depending on whether you're traveling off peak or, and before long, maybe all of, um, we will, we are to na hii tuliambiwa ni a nation reporter, let me just find it. Uh, easy. You know, is this, is he playing with our psychology here? Or will this, or does this reverberate across all sectors it's not just about uber and fish fingers i think uh, there's some this this uh, a statement you quoted i think the deputy president mm -hmm. about leaders uh, having some humility and decorum so when uh, when moses kuri attacks the media attacks uh, raise a kot and then he goes back to the same place and tweets or exes now that, that's the new name uh -huh. yes mm -hmm. i think that is uh, being insensitive so the problem we are facing now is not a problem that affects the rich or the poor. Everybody is affected by the fuel in one way or the other. Whether you drive a V8 or a Vitz or a Matatu, you take a Matatu, you are affected by that. And what we should be doing is not being arrogant. It's just facing the problem head on. If you look at the price of fuel, and I like the data he gave, that what is going to happen to China, what is going to happen to other countries, it's very good data. And he says he is going to use science and not Vundu. Uh, that, that was quite a mouthful, and I, I'm hoping the government will be 
we will avoid the voodoo in every area. <laughs> I am very happy with this statement so that whatever decisions we make should not be based on Twitter, should not be based on mob, but should be based on facts and data. So I think that that, that, that would be okay on a side. But when we come to the, the price of fuel, which is uh, bringing a lot of, uh, making uh, a lot of emotions, I think there are two ways to that. One of them is the international market, which Kuri has explained very well. And, and the other one is what uh, my friend Moreu brought up, that we have alternatives, the, the renewables. Like any time I check my bill for power, I always see something fuel that I'm supposed to pay. And I always wonder, why should I pay for fuel to generate power when you have so much renewable, geothermal, weed, solar, and so on. So, so when we talk about the IMF structural adjustment program, probably we should also look at it in every sector. Every sector should go some structural adjustment. So that we start questioning, ask, asking hard questions. The same questions you are, we are asking now at the short national level should be asked at the sectoral level. So if you go to the energy sector, we ask, what can we do differently? What can we do to reduce the cost of power? What can we do to reduce the cost of medical service? What can we do to reduce the cost of education? What can we do to reduce the cost of power, of, of food, for example? So, so this national debate should be cascaded to the lowest level so that as a nation we start asking hard questions on every sector, on every activity that we do. But brief, whether you want or not, we must think about fuel power. Finally, let me ask uh, this question that Muria, Kuria raised, Moses Kuria. Why don't you get your own oil, oil well? I thought we have a lot of oil wells in this country, in northern Kenya. Why are we not exploiting them? The, in fact, the, that question the quality has of, I think the issue is the quality of the oil. It's very dense or something. No, no, we become innovative. We can come up with new technology. In the U.S. and other countries, they frack even, even deeper, sand. even deeper sun and they get oil from it. Why can't we get this oil and we reduce the cost of fuel? Mm -hmm. But I, I can assure you for free, I would be very happy if I own an oil well. Because we are green, <laughs> Prof, we are green and we are told we generate um, <laughs> how much green energy? Ni over 90% of our grid is green, uh, but also there are issues with that grid because uh, when, when uh, the energy CS was being grilled on the blackout, uh, he said we have very serious issues uh, with said grid, but uh, that's a story for another day. Uh, Kinyua, should, because you know how much of uh, the cost of fuel is on account of the present cost of fuel is on account of mismanagement and and i asked that because uh, the other day we had a report in uh, the business daily and reportedly we paid 1.7 billion that we should not have paid because of a decision taken at the, by the ps um, in the ministry of energy and uh, fuel consumers stand to lose an estimated 1.7 billion shillings after the government allowed one supplier to sell the product at prices that have been inflated by 17 percent in a fresh scandal that has split players in the industry at the center of the dispute is oryx energies limited which was picked alongside galana oil kenya by saudi aramco as the supplier of diesel to other oil marketing companies in the country for a period of 270 days or about nine months oryx was contracted to ship 85,000 metric tons of automotive gas oil uh, commonly referred to as diesel between august the 12th and 14th however the company wrote to the ministry of energy and petroleum arguing that because there was a delay at discharging fuel at the jetty it'd be allowed to delay delivering the cargo for six more days to avoid demurrage charges and on august 18th the petroleum principal secretary mohammed liban uh, wrote to Oryx Managing Director, essentially um, causing us. Uh, okay, it's a long story, but essentially, it, 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 they deferred, I mean, they moved the payments, uh, I think, to the next month where the prices were higher, but already uh, oil marketers had, the oil that they export had already gone, so now they could not recall that oil or call those people that they supply and say, oh, by the way, panda, the rest they could move on to the consumer domestically. But essentially, decisions such as this, are you in agreement with those who are saying heads should roll? I know you talked okay. about dissent. F first of all, uh -huh. first of all, um, articles of 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 the. I'm an investment analyst. We mm -hmm. normally say articles of the media. We don't always take them as the truth <laughs> until we have verifiable facts. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe you know. Remember, although this, uh, for the record, has been acknowledged by the Energy CS. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Remember, we used to suffer lack of fear where. I know some people became genius in knowing where the fuel is and taking a lot of it for themselves and holding. But right now we have expensive fuel. Uh, it, for a truth, the value chain needs to be looked at. 
uh, I was seeing that for every liter oil marketers, oil marketers actually, before they were very opposed to uh, the regulation of fuel on the, by the government, they're setting, but right now they do not want uh, that the government to liberalize the sector because they are assured of um, 12, over 12 shillings per every liter they pour into your car, which in my view is, is I think is quite a bit uh, and they are all happy that the system is working for them and all that. So, obviously, when fuel is cost is very high, we need to 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 to, to go back because the government has a very big interest in the price and the cost of fuel because it drives the economy. Let's go back to where we order the fuel. We had a, the open system where one oil marketer would go to the international market and bid for a fuel, and apparently because they could order a big quantity for the whole of our country the fuel was cheap, was, was ob uh, obtained for a lower cost. What I want to say is this. We have flexibility in terms of how much we tax our fuel. If you look at the fuel, uh, the railway development levy is there. Road maintenance levy is there. What other countries have done is that, um, why can't we even as a country actually go buy those oils in Middle East and mine them? Because that is what the big oil majors, British Petroleum, Rubies have done. They, they are in Nigeria uh, mining as a country because we'll always need oil. We have, we had a very, uh, we had thought of an organization to help us, Kenya National Oil Corporation, owned by government to help stabilize the cost of fuel in this country. However, right now, yes, as, Mos as the PS Moses Kuria says, the winter is coming and Europe is hungry for fuel to warm up itself and we know now we are experiencing extreme weather. The cost of um, shipping can be checked into down, uh, the jetty in Mombasa. We transport a lot of our oil on road because our pipeline sometimes um, gets overwhelmed because of uh, the, the capacity. Now, and all the alteration, the amount of cars we have on the road, if we had probably a better public transport system, because we need also as a country to reduce our demand uh, for, for diesel and, and probably have a more efficient transport sector. I don't think our hands are completely tied up. And because remember also as fuel goes up, as the dollar goes up, through economic cycles, it still goes down uh, over time because um, sometimes we've seen the fuel go up and go down. However, I think my parting shot on this, businesses should be anticipating, as Moses Kuria said, even forming scenarios. What would happen if fuel went up by an extra 100 shillings? How do we survive? How do we operate? And that is business planning. And our, our businesses need to do that because the price of fuel, you cannot control it. It's given as an entrepreneur, as, as, as schools, as users of fuel. And unless you model those scenarios, if they come to bear to be the truth, a lot, there will be a lot of damage to, you know, to enterprises that will not prepare ourselves. But the government, and we are having this discourse, I think should always think, what, how can we cushion our, our citizens? Because that's what all countries are doing. How, how are you going to make our Kenyan businesses competitive on a global basis? So otherwise, if our businesses collapse, remember, Foreigners, including the Chinese, are waiting to supply our factories if they can't afford to run because of expensive um, power, which means okay. no jobs for our citizens. That means we import more and the shilling becomes worse because we are buying more from abroad. All right. So I'd like us to move on because I'm looking like we have like 10 minutes or so to go. To, so what are we saying needs to happen, right? Uh, because, and, and also, before then, Dr. Abraham, uh, I'll ask you, where are we between economic stability and uh, the brink? <laughs> uh, I, 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 on which end are we? Or are we somewhere there in the middle? But I just want to take... Um, I, I did mention that CS had responded to the issue of the to the business daily report and this is what he said amid growing public uh, sorry this is what the sunday nation reported yesterday amid growing public outage uh, outrage over the trickle down effect of the sky high pump prices energy and petroleum cs davis churcher gave mixed messages on the one hand he said kenyans were likely to enjoy a reprieve next month after the government successfully renegotiated the freight and premiums of super diesel and jet fuel industry players had previously told the sunday nation kenya had been given a bad deal 
certainly he's quoted as saying we will enjoy the benefits of the renegotiated freight and premium this coming month and all the global factors uh we are experiencing he said on the on friday but on the other hand he told the national assembly's committee on energy on friday that there was little the government could do to control the global factors and kenyans should brace themselves for higher prices in fact uh i have it here there we go we are likely to be going to harder times because of the prices from opec there is nothing we can do i wish it was still possible to subsidize but we had some covenants with the imf the pain is heavy and it is not going to be easy uh he has been quoted as saying uh, but uh, uh dr abraham rugo muriu where are we we were told by the president because kenya is ahead of schedule in paying its debts um the president told us the economy is stable on that account on the account that inflation uh, has gone down but when we read uh, that the dailies we are told the exchange rate is up to 150 we read reports such as uh, where is it here capital flight house nsc investor wealth what are we to believe um i, I think one is that uh, we as I said earlier, one is that we are not uh, in the best place because we have very heavy debt obligations to pay. What that means is that uh, the, the the space the space to be able to maneuver, you know, and uh, subsidize even where we where we need to subsidize is is quite 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 limited. Uh, two things I look at. One is that unless we quickly uh, address incomes incomes of individuals and incomes of corporations we are likely to hit uh you know uh, almost a dead end look at for instance the growth in uh, in revenue whereas we have raised more in terms of tax uh, in the last two months uh, of the of the current financial year that is in uh, june july and august uh the growth has been almost at a third how it grew in the previous in the previous year uh, of a similar period uh, so in other words which tells you that uh, basically we are actually uh, the growth in tax collection is actually slower than 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 would be than would be would be expected that has nothing to do with the fact that uh, KRA is working or not working but it also has a significant uh, significantly to do with incomes so as long as incomes uh, stagnate and reduce uh, both of, uh, of, of, of of persons, uh, you know, uh, natural persons and also state co and, and corporations, uh, that is private sector, then that, that becomes a, a concern too. If government expenditure continues at the same rate it is continuing right now, if we continue spending at the same rate and now the budget even for the following year, you know, if our deficit continues to grow, it's already grown, you know, uh, even in the year, if our deficit continues to grow, then it means that uh, our revenues will not be able to match our expenditure. Based on those two accounts alone, I think you already start seeing the fact that if you're not going to raise more taxes and your expenditures are going to continue going up, then you will, you will definitely get to a point where you are not able to provide services unless you go back to the borrowing. Now, the borrowing already, we are having this, I mean, we had from the, uh, from the, uh, from the governor of CBK, uh, basically saying that the treasury has already changed tact and now is going to even borrow more uh, uh, you know uh, externally uh, than, than than internally as as than domestically as had been indicated 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 earlier so if, if i was to ask you you answer your question right now we are more near the brink uh, in, my, in, 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 in my opinion, uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in not only a tight spot, but basically where we are only, you see, if all you're able to do is only pay your debts, then what are you saying? You know, um, uh, so we have to address those two things that I've said. First, reduction in government expenditure, which, because we cannot continue saying that Kenyans need to brace themselves, Kenyans need to be prepared for hard times without asking, why should it only be Kenyans? Why can't government also prepare for hard times by reducing its own costs, uh, its, its, its own running? Must all projects be done now? Must all campaign promises be fulfilled right now? Must we continue to split and create a fund for every other thing, uh, you know, that we imagine needs to be addressed? I don't think so. I think we can delay some gratification in, in government uh, so that to be able so that all of us brace ourselves 
uh, in, in terms of that because once you address expenditure it gives you some wiggle room uh, uh, lastly I think we it is inevitable that we will have to just have a conversation on what to do with our domestic debt I know this affects Kenyans directly many who have bought bonds and deal and uh, treasury bills but I think it is time to have that conversation out of the 1.6 trillion that we are paying a significant amount of that I think almost 900 billion if I'm not wrong is going to interest rates uh, you know uh, within the country and, 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 and that means then uh, yes the, the investors the people who have put in money of course gain 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 something uh, but then it means that collectively uh, you know the, the pain the pain will become unbearable and that's been the story of Ghana uh, if you read the story of Ghana and just what happens with their, with their domestic market uh, when government got to a point where they are not able 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 to pay uh, because the renegotiation at the international market I think it's proving to be a bit of a challenge uh, it's a bit difficult perhaps we can have an internal conversation uh, that's my take thank you all right uh, Prof XN Iraqi if you are to be an economic advisor and and uh, because <laughs> and speaking of i asked the question who should we believe right uh so when musin asked the same musin ali asked the same question of david the economic advisor to the president is the economic advisor telling kenyans shouldn't believe anything the president and the, his deputy say is that official and this is what he said i don't believe politicians and i don't trust government if you do either you are a sucker so, um, Prof. X and Iraqi, if you were in David D's shoes, <laughs> would you be, I know you said you're an optimist. Yes. But yes. what would be your advice to the Kenyan government? I, I think I will make uh, a few quick comments about, uh, and the key issue we are discussing now is the fuel prices, mm -hmm. and maybe a few other issues. One of them is, I would say, set the fuel market free. I don't think the price of fuel should be decided in, bedroom, in boardrooms when the market can do that. Mm -hmm. Number two, let's look at the whole the whole fuel supply chain and I'm happy the minister in charge of that was talking about it from the oil wells up to the fuel pumps there are a lot of costs that we can reduce along the way and some of the most successful companies like Apple I'm sure you all have Apple phones mm -hmm. have been very successful because of managing the, the whole supply chain let's do the same number three the government the minister is saying we cannot do anything about the international fuel prices but we can do something about the taxes there are so many fuel there are many taxes on fuel tax there are so many taxes on fuel so why can't we reduce some of them? As Moreau put it, let's all make sacrifices. If the government wants me to make a sacrifice, they can also make a sacrifice by reducing the taxes on fuel. But number four, which is the most important one, and I think this is what we should be focusing on. The current Kenya, Kenya, Kenya Kwanza government has been invoking President Kibaki's name, that we want to be like Kibaki. But if you look at Kibaki's regime, he did not do any magic. He just made us feel good, made us feel optimistic, we consumed, we, we made the economy grow. So if the government can make us feel good about ourselves, make us feel that tomorrow is better than today, make us feel that and convince us that the pains we are going through are worth sacrificing or are worth bearing, there's no reason how we cannot ta turn out this economy. Because when you talk about tax, you tax people who have income. If they are not with income, who do you tax? Now we talk about borrowing, you borrow because you believe you'll make more income in future. So, so I believe that it's, a just not, it's not just a question of looking at the hard facts, but also looking at the emotional facts. In fact, uh, one of the quarrels I have with you is that you should have brought a psychologist into this forum <laughs> today to tell us or to, to help us understand how Kenyans react to the hardships. Uh -huh. Because that, those emotional issues are as, as important as hard, as hard issues as any economist will tell you. The sentimental part, the emotional part of it matters. And I think that's where we are feeling. All right, I, when you remember who comes on right after AM Live on your world had actually done that some time back. Alaska to bring them back. Uh, but uh, Kenya, which way forward? I, I think um, just as my colleagues on the panel today have said, uh, even the loans, uh, I know they sign very tough covenants, but loans can also be renegotiated so that you don't have to pay everything today. And talking of Kibaki government, the tax levels were not where they are proposed to be, especially next year. Although it's interesting, and sorry, sorry, you've reminded me of something. Although David D argues that it's the Grand Coalition government that set us on this path, but sorry, continue. continue. And yet, the country mm -hmm. developed. Yeah, you know, the, can you see that irony that um, when, when Kibaki took over, the economy was in a very bad spot, I, and the country developed without taxing Kenyans as heavily as it's proposed. So, 
by theory, it's possible to say that if the current levels of taxation remain, the country could develop if people, if the government does what Kibaki did at that time. But loans can be extended uh, for a very long time. Um, you renegotiate and, and, and so, so the burden is not immediate. Um, taxation can be introduced gently to grow the economy. We, we, I will defend the right of the people who want to tell us the truth to tell us. And if, <laughs> if somebody says fuel will go up by 10 shillings every month, can somebody else come and prove that's not true? Because we can also fall into the trap of giving our citizens false hopes, telling them, no, don't talk about it, then they, they get hit. So the thing is, right now, um, we are still dealing with shocks of fuel past 200 or past 210. What we need is to think, how shall we survive? Because other foreign nations will not come help us. As individuals, we will be forced to institute measures in our own personal budget and money planning that, so that we are able to survive. Because we can talk about politics, cost of fear the whole day, but that will not meet our cost of living. Of course, the government needs to pay its bills. We need to pay its bills. We need to, to save. The government needs to save. And I think that should be the next conversation. Where can we prevent leakages of our revenue? You okay. pay taxes, I pay taxes. Mm -hmm. All of us are very keen to see that whatever we share with the government, like the developed countries, they pay a lot of taxes, yet the government takes care of them very well. That paying taxes per se doesn't become the issue. Okay. Mm. Um, your last word, Dr. Abraham. Uh, thank you, thank you. I think I want to, to agree with, uh, with colleagues, but I, I, I just wanted to come, come, come back to uh, the fact that those who speak and give alternative ideas need also to appreciate uh, uh, that they are in government. I think we are the people we have been discussing and uh, sharing their views are all in government, they are in senior positions in government, they have public trust, they have public responsibility, they have access to all resources that we provide in terms of uh, technical uh, and financial to help us solve our problems, not to, to join us. Uh, in conversations, you know, in armchair conversations, uh, and perhaps uh, you know, uh, only in future, we need we need the government officials on this platform to also come and explain what exactly they are doing in concrete terms. Uh, we can't just be talking to ourselves. Uh, of course, we hope they are least they are listening. Uh, but but secondly, I think. Um, uh, for me, we have a grand opportunity. I think it's Winston Churchill who said, never waste a good crisis. Uh, we are in a proper crisis. Let's not waste it. Let's make advantage of it. Let's renegotiate what needs to be renegotiated. Let's push forward what needs to be pushed forward. Let us delay what must and can be delayed. But let us not sacrifice what is most critical, the health of our, of our, of our, of our people, the education, because that of course makes a very big difference, the investments that we must make in, in agriculture. And that does not mean spending more money, it simply means spending more efficiently uh, uh, so, so, so that then we can assure our people. But more importantly, let us spend the money in the right way that it should be spent. Let's reduce the wastage. The fight on corruption cannot just be a fight. It must be a reality. You know, it must be something that actually is practically, practically done. When we do that, I'm, I'm very concerned because all that drives all where we are is the cost of government. So if we don't address the cost of government, uh, it, 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 you know, we will not be able to, to, to make progress. But for our leaders, for our policymakers, members of parliament, uh, you know, cabinet secretaries and their advisors, they need to take the public responsibility seriously and help us solve problems. We can give suggestions, but they are the only ones who can implement them because we have given them the various instruments uh, that they need. Thank you very much and have enjoyed the conversation this morning. Thank you, Dr. I hope we've given them food for thought. And uh, thank you, my panelists, for helping me make sense or helping us as Kenyans make sense uh, of, of what we've been hearing from different quarters and for providing some insight into the true state of the economy. Kenya in receivership, economy stable or on the brink? Government's mixed messages with me in studio this morning. I've had Karumba Kinwa, investment consultant. Thank you for coming through. Uh, I've also had Professor Exen Iraqi, economist, columnist, lecturer. Nishkileto Apo. And Dowry Negotiator. Dowry Negotiator. And Winnie Lubembe, by the way, he says, if you can't organize a psychologist to tell us how to cope with this tough economic times, uh, Dr. Abraham Rugo Muri joining us, virtually country manager, International Budget Partnership Kenya.
That's it for AM Live. My name is Olive Burrows. Good morning. Winnie Lubeme coming up next with Your World.